Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. Now, we did a little chat well, recently where we were talking about Boccherini, Boccherini symphonies, Opus 35 on Glossa, which were like, Rawr! very misconceived performances. And one of you said, well, what is the best uh, cycle of Boccherini symphonies? Well, that's an easy question to answer because there's only one. Fortunately, it's a very good one. So I thought I would just let you know. Here it is. It's the Complete Symphonies with the Deutsche Kammer Academy Neuss, N-E-U-S-S, -S, under Johannes Goritzky. Now, there are 28 symphonies. Boccherini wrote 28 or 29. There is a Singleton album, not part of this. It has one of this delicious divertimento. Oh, it's delightful. I did another talk about it, a separate talk about it with musical examples. So you can look at that video in the Boccherini playlist. Please use the composer playlists. There are like 150 composer playlists on my channel with all the videos where those composers get mentioned for whatever reason. So it's a very easy way for you to figure out your discography and also to look at reviews on classicstoday.com. Now, this particular box, it's just the individual discs of the series, which are a lot of which are still available. I mean, this is still available, so it's got to be available. Um, eight discs containing the 28 symphonies. Most of them came in clumps. For a while, Boccherini was the court composer to Frederick the Great, even though he was like in Spain, but that didn't work too well or last too long. He wasn't really a symphonist in the sense that he devoted a lot of his time to that. He was a chamber music guy, and he wrote over 400 and something chamber works, string quartets, string quintets, all kinds of things, and they're just wonderful. He was a wonderful composer, I've said a billion times. So we have the Symphonies Opus 7, and then Opus 10, number four, some other things. Then we, let's see, there are six symphonies, Opus 12, five symphonies, Opus 12, six symphonies, Opus 21, six symphonies, Opus 35. Um, how many of Opus 37? It looks like one, one, three, and four. Like three of them, Opus 37 or so. Oh, then there's some individual singleton works, Opus 41, Opus 42, Opus 45. The most famous of them... Um, is part of the Opus 12 set, if I'm not mistaken. Let me let me stop just blabbing and give you some valuable, pertinent information here. Um, which one is from the from the House of the Dead or from the House of the Devil? That's the one that everybody talks about. Uh, it's like Nella Casa del Diavolo. Well, of course, I don't remember what opus number is. That's why we give nicknames to things in the world of classical music, because it's just way too complicated to try and figure out what all these opus whatever numbers some things are and what key and all that stuff. It's a pain in the ass, isn't it? So we figure out what the name is. And I will tell you which one that is. Give me a second here. Uh, Boccherini. The reason that symphony is so cool is because it, it quotes the Dance of the Furies, from uh, Gluck's ballet, Don Juan. Well, it's the dance of, you know, Don Juan going down to hell, La Casa del Diavolo. That's what it's called. Thank you. Um, and it's really an absolutely nifty piece, especially for what it does, what it does to, to Gluck. Uh, let's see here. Boccherini. There it is. It's, oh, of course, it's G506 Opus 124, which does us absolutely no good. Now I have to find the G number. Well, we know it's in D minor. This is why the world of classical music makes me crazy sometimes. Here we are, La Casa del Diavolo. Does this tell us what it is? Opus 12, number four. Yay! It also has a G number because Boccherini has G number. It's G number 506, in case you were curious. So yes, Opus 12. I knew it was Opus 12. At least I got that part right. So it's on disc number three in this series, which has Opus 12, numbers four through six. It's very, very cool. It's a symphony. The form in these symphonies is amazing. I know I sound very scattered and all that stuff about this, but I, I get very excited about this music because Boccherini gets no credit for being the inventive genius that he was. And he was, because this is way before a lot of this. It's the 1770s, 1780s, and everyone calls it pre-classical. I think it's just the other way. I think it sounds far more forward-looking then a lot of the pieces being written in Vienna at the time, including Haydn's. That doesn't mean that Haydn's weren't great. They were. But in terms of 
his own style and craft and musical language and inventiveness. Boccherini was really up there and he wasn't regressive. He wasn't like backwards leaning as people sort of imply by him, not in the least bit. He was a chord guy, as I've said many times. I mean, his, his orchestration is extremely rich and succulent. He likes divided strings. He's incredibly meticulous in his marking of dynamics and accent and phrasing. And his attention to texture is really detailed. He's like the, the Richard Strauss of the classical period, if you want to think of it that way. Maybe a, a second-rate composer, but a very good second-rate composer, if you want to call him that. I think he's a first-rate composer. I think, I think his contribution was, was, was sidelined because politically and historically, music history is written by the winners. And the winners were the first Viennese school, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, who gave, gave, you know, gave, 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 led to all the other German romantics. And, and you know, musicology was largely a German thing. And so those are the ones that we're told to value. But these massive bodies of works by by other composers who are enormously gifted get roundly disregarded. And Boccherini was both forward thinking. He was in Vienna. I mean, he knew Haydn. He knew all these people. He knew Gluck. He played under Gluck in the orchestra, the Berg Theater and whatnot. So he had that that initial initial um, you know provenance. But his own style and character took him elsewhere. And as a result of that, we have this wonderful, wonderful body of work that's like nobody else's. And these 28 symphonies are manageable. It's not so many that you have to go crazy listening to all 5,000 of them or whatever. Um, they're available, this lovely little eight disc box, and, and they're, they're delicious, charming, full of character, formally very, very interesting. I mean, before I got off of this crazy tangent, we were talking about La Casa del Diavolo. That begins with an introduction which comes back in the finale. Absolutely. It's a, it's a symphony in cyclical form at a time when cyclical forms were unheard of. I mean, things like that. You have really, really interesting things to listen to with these pieces. They are not big, ballsy, pedal-to-the-metal symphonies of the kind that Haydn developed and Beethoven sort of took over. They are they are much closer to chamber music and their sensibilities. They are softer edged. They're delicate in some ways. But all that means is that you have to listen differently. You, know, you just have to give them the time and attention that they deserve and, and take them for what they are and you will be enchanted. So here it is on CPO. Get it while it's hot. And keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.